Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 126 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with returning guest Greg Tepper, senior horticulturist at Laurel Hill, all about garden cemeteries. The plant profile is on Celosia, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We also solicit contributions for a new segment, The Last Word. This episode, we're joined by senior horticulturist Greg Tepper of Laurel Hill. Welcome, Greg. Oh, thank you, Kathy. Glad to be here. And I should note that Greg is a returning guest of the Garden DC podcast. You were previously on episode 50, and you were talking about deer-resistant native plants um, with the book that you co-authored on that topic, and the co-host or co-guest was Ruth rogers Clausen. Yes, indeed. And and today I'm going to be able to also touch on the uh, deer herbivory issues we are challenged with at the cemetery. So, mm-hmm. Yes, definitely of interest. So our overall topic today is garden cemeteries. And I've kind of have a subtitle for that, uh, the first urban parks, or maybe we can even say the first public gardens. Mm, indeed. And these cemeteries, of which Laurel Hill, uh, the two locations, are one, were also what was known as rural cemeteries. And I can explain why when we get into it. Hmm. Yeah, let's dive into some of that history. So what I had been doing some research on um, was 17th, 18th century garden cemeteries. And uh, that was because the downtown urban cemeteries became kind of, I don't know a polite way to say it, untenable. (laughs) <laughs> that they were not not pleasant places to be, so that they then located their burial spots for their loved ones, usually on the highest part of town. Is that what you found in your research, Greg? Well, it's interesting because um, the that would make sense uh, for sure. You would not want to have people being buried where uh, the soil uh, is is wet, uh, especially right after a spring thaw when you have to bury people that have passed in the wintertime. Mm. So yes, definitely high grounds. And Laurel Hill is just such a cemetery. It's on the banks of the Schuylkill River, but um, uh, quite, a, quite a distance above on, a, on a, a large hill, both properties. We have East, which is in the East Falls section of Philadelphia. And we have West, which is in Ballot Kinwood, Pennsylvania, both on the upper banks of the Schuylkill River. Hmm. And beautiful views of that river from the cemetery. Yes, um, especially at east. At west, you don't see the view as much except for in the wintertime. However, at east, the uh, signs of the, the hillsides are actually terraced. And that was intentional so that people that would be buried uh, with loved ones would come to see them. They would uh, uh, have a beautiful view of the Schuylkill River. So. Yeah, it's it's something, Kathy, because in the, uh, the the city cemeteries, they filled up. And that was another challenge. If you may have a, a church with a, a graveyard there, and the graveyard could only accommodate so many people. And so it got to a point where they needed to really move uh, cemeteries outside the city. And Laurel Hill was one of those types of cemeteries. It originally opened in 1836 as a rural cemetery. And at the time, it was truly rural. It was out in the farmland. And when people would come to visit it, it was a um, wonderfully uh, delightful respite from the city uh, congestion and smell. And out in these um, rural areas, the, there was it was hilly and the, these, these rolling hillsides, fresh air. And it was a, it was a delight to uh, not only pay respects to uh, loved ones, but to see the beautiful architecture in the monuments and stones that were part of this, as well as the gardens. 
and the plantings that were on this on on the site. So that's what made them so, I would say, just really attractive to to people from the city. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, modern uh, civilization, we forget that there was an AC back then. So (laughs) the other probably attractant was being up in the hills and a little bit of breeze and some shade or trees planted there. So I always wonder, uh, garden cemeteries often have beautiful tree collections. A lot of them are certified as arboretums today, but did the, were some of those trees pre um, grave site or post? And of course they're still planting new ones today, but did they pick the locations because of those beautiful trees is, is what I'm thinking chicken and egg type thing. Uh, yes. So the best way I can describe uh, naturally my experience is with Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West the two locations outside of Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area. And so um, what Laurel Hill started as in 1836, as I mentioned, a rural cemetery, and it was much more than just a place to be buried. If you think about it, in 1836, there were no city, state, or national parks. Mm -hmm. This was not only a place for people to be buried, but it was a place for the public to enjoy a park-like setting. So that's really how they got started. As far as the trees, this was a this was a place where the owners, and in our case at Laurel Hill, it was John J. Smith, the founder. He was also a hobbyist horticulturist. He was a Quaker. He loved horticulture, and he uh, began a tree, shrub, and uh, herbaceous plant collection at the cemetery. Hmm. And... I've been to cemeteries in other cities like Atlanta, where it's literally a a garden at each grave planted by your loved ones. And I assume maintained over the generations and then others where it's mainly grass. And do you find a big difference in the history of that? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something because um, I want to give an example of another rural cemetery, which is a great thing for your listeners to look into. It's Mount Auburn which is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Um, Laurel Hill was modeled after that. It opened, I believe, three to four years before ours did in 1836. And the idea of planting was done purposefully from the start, trees, shrubs, and herbaceous materials. And the families were involved. They wanted to make choices about what was actually on their lots And then there would be common areas that would have the trees and shrub plantings. So families were highly involved in the past. In fact, in the late 19th century, um, they had a style of grave called a cradle grave. And you would say, oh, cradle, that means it's for uh, uh, babies or death of Mm. children. Mm -hmm. It's actually not. It's just just a style of the monument. And so there's a headstone and a footstone. It looks like a headboard and a footboard of a bed. And then there's coping that held soil above the soil surface that was already there. So you could do plantings on your loved one's uh, graves. And that was, uh, we call them garden graves or, or cradle graves today. Yeah. So as far as the tree collection, yes, many of our um, modern uh, cemeteries are all, also arboreta. Uh, they are. They have an amazing tree collection, and if you think about it, these once rural cemeteries are now in highly populated areas of uh, near cities, and these areas are beautifully laid out. They're like a sculpture garden. They're also an urban forest. These are places where trees exist and shrubs exist, and with trees and shrubs, naturally have people coming in to enjoy the layout. But there's also the wildlife benefit. Hundreds of different types of insects, mammals, and birds ha- um, are um, use these areas as, as habitat. So we think of our cemetery today as an urban forest. So with our planting that we do, we're planting trees um, for collection's sake, for sure, you know, to have an interesting collection that appeals to the public, but also for their uh, pollinator and wildlife benefit. Hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that, you know, wildlife feel pretty comfortable where humans are mostly coming during the day just for short periods, and then they're going back home afterwards, not, you know, 
maybe there's a caretaker who lives on property, but not too many humans in those early, early morning hours and those dusk hours that most of our uh, mammals in North America like to be the most active. And I'm thinking particularly of those deer you've referred to earlier. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. So we actually see quite an interesting variety of mammals and birds. So um, being right along the Schuylkill River um, uh, in a river setting, I have seen osprey. I've seen different types. Uh, Naturally, we see um, red-tailed hawks. I've seen um, a variety of different types of uh, songbirds. Uh, the wood thrush is there, which is great. Those are always inhabiting areas that have a leaf layer. Um, and we do have some of that in our cemetery. And um, a scarlet tanager I saw this past summer. And what a joy to look up into the canopy and, and see these. So yes, it's a very viable place for wildlife as well, even though we're there during the day. So. One thing too, Kathy, I wanted to mention was, uh, it's it's really funny, you know, I got into, I've worked there now for three and a half years, <clears throat> excuse me, and in the public garden realm and the, and the uh, arboretum realm, when you collect living plants, you call it a living collection of plants, right? Living collection. So I love to, I love to uh, kid with my friends and colleagues and say, yes, I'm the senior horticulturist. And I get to build a living collection at a cemetery. (laughs) Very true. And that does remind me of one of our past episodes we did with uh, Connie Hilker on heritage roses. And that she does a lot of her rose collecting of, you know, no longer available um, heirloom roses at Southern cemeteries. So that is one thing that older cemeteries are keeping alive, so to speak, you know, maybe by accident, maybe by neglect. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are some plant collections that you're not going to find anywhere else, but at cemeteries these days. That's exactly right. And I think of some of the plants I see regularly are roses. I see, uh, tall bearded irises typically are very long lived. <clears throat> different types of narcissus for sure, daffodils and so forth. And um, um, also uh, yuccas. That's another thing that gets planted and seems to live forever. So you will see those in a lot of our, our cemeteries. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's um, the collection collecting is, is really, that's another whole fascinating topic that I love to talk about. It's not necessarily about collecting, like we can go out in the wild and collect uh, but we collaborate with other arboreta and botanic gardens, and they share their uh, woody plant collection and their uh, herbaceous collections. And so we add them to our collection. So um, <clears throat> we've been, for example, at Laurel Hill East and West, um, we've been a very, uh, uh, I, I guess, you're very, very grateful to receive uh, plant collections from places like Chicago Botanic Gardens in, in Illinois and Longwood Gardens uh, in Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania, and Morris Arboretum, which is very near to us in Chestnut Hill. So we're fortunate to uh, be a benefit of their uh, the additional plant material that they have propagated and they share with other industry, um, I should say other arboreta like ourselves. Hmm. And is there any limitation for your plant collection, uh, so to speak, as a a historic garden, say like Monticello or others might only plant things in the period uh, of the history. So are you open to having anything or is a specific period that you're working in? That's a, that's an excellent question. And really what I would say is what I would say, that's our collection mission or collection range. You could also consider it. Um, And so our focus, collection focus. So I would say, our focus is really on um, offering uh, trees and shrubs and herbaceous plants that do well in the Philadelphia area. That's really probably our focus. Ones that will thrive there, uh, even with climate change, naturally things that would uh, had uh, perhaps in the past not been hardy there, we're finding able to grow now. Things that were zone seven, zone eight <clears throat> are actually becoming um, and are uh, uh, able to endure the winters. Uh, in Philadelphia. And so, uh, so we have definitely expanded that, but 
Um, as you come into the cemetery, and I was so delighted to have you with the um, uh, Garden Communicators uh, event at that time to see the Medallion Garden. So when you when mm-hmm. you we talk about a collection focus, things that grow well in the Philadelphia area, when you saw the Medallion Garden, that is a um, it's historically it was a place for shrubs. It was known as the shrubbery. So its collection focus is on shrubs. That's what we have in that area. There are other things like roses, uh, which w- we have some some wonderful roses, as well as herbaceous plants. So, but our collection focus there is on shrubs that are unusual, unique, and also that are in proper scale with the size of the medallion garden as it is now. It's a geometrically shaped garden that is just so beautiful, and uh, and so our focus is on putting in shrubs and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that do well in the Philadelphia area, but also tend to be either compact or dwarf. So that's a focus we also have in the Medallion Garden. So, um, but for the most part, overall, we are just uh, interested in growing all sorts of, of unique trees and shrubs, as well as new cultivated varieties. Our only draw, Our only limit, I would say, is anything that is known to be invasive or potentially invasive, uh, we will not add to our collection. Hmm. Yeah, that would be good for all public gardens, obviously. And there's some winnowing there of older plants, I'm imagining. And uh, it's a good thing you, you did notice you note the dwarf or compact forms of some of the shrubs or trees, because I can imagine that space um, is a huge issue, not just for, for being able to see across a landscape, but also space pressures in general. So are there rules about how close um, to either the roadside or path or to the grave sites that you can plant? Yes. So, so it's a, I would say that's an unwritten rule. It's about scale, making sure that the shrub that we place in these uh, specific size geometric shaped beds just does not get so large that it's out of scale. It's too tall, too wide. The branches are hitting people as they as they walk down the pathways. So that's important. Plus, another thing is I really, uh, with a very few exceptions, I like the 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 shrubs to have their natural form. Meaning, why gila? Let's use that as an example. Uh, that's a wonderful flowering shrub in the in the early summer, late spring, and. We prune it to keep it in scale so that it's not too big for the space. However, we don't shear it. We don't shape it like a ball or a cube. Um, That is, we just don't do that. We have a few places where that's done for formality, um, only because the space where they might be is for a hedge and they're they're pruned to keep them uh, formal looking. But other than that, I allow them to have their natural character and habit and you can really enjoy seeing some of these shrubs that we so often see tightly pruned and, and contained in a more natural, uh, unnatural way. And um, it's, it's all about pruning and knowing how to do it properly so that you can keep the scale, keep the flowering, and not, um, not have it look like uh, you've just, you know, uh, buzz cut it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I can imagine there's a lot of um, pressure on you because cemeteries, you know, fairly formal, um, you know, fairly formal landscapes in comparison to, you know, a regular public garden or park and somewhere in between there. And that there's also expectations from your visitors. So yeah. um, how did those weigh in as factors? Yeah. So so what I think um, everybody that visits a cemetery, and that's a great um, inquiry, um, something that, that with people that visit the cemetery, we want them to see that it is is well cared for. So they see that it is, they're properly maintained, they're thinned, there's no dead branches, but they don't, that the cue necessarily isn't that they're all uh, pruned into balls or cubes, but they are well maintained and groomed. So that's important. And they always, we do our best to make sure they always look uh, presentable uh, and, and not, you know, dead in them or, or, uh, or whatever it may be. So natural form, 
that they would normally grow, yet um, uh, pruned to be healthy and and uh, and groomed so that they appear to be neat and orderly. That's that's really my my uh, uh, focus on on that as far as its care. Hmm. And uh, kind of hand in hand in that is some cemeteries in Laurel Hill East. You know, very dense condensed one you know packed yeah uh but i always get lost and maybe on purpose <laughs> but there's you're looking for a specific gravesite or you're looking for a specific piece of art or statue that you know is somewhere on on there but you know you turn one corner and you're like where am i so um how long did it take you at both uh sections of laurel hill to get your bearings so I learned very great question too. I love these questions, Kathy. These are awesome. Um, the <laughs> it took me, let's say, I'm going to say about six months to a year before I felt like I could really navigate the cemetery. And this is mm-hmm. what was the key for me: picking reference points, knowing that oh, here's a mausoleum for the Shadowald family, or here's the Smith mausoleum. I knew that if I made a right turn at the Smith Mausoleum, it would eventually take me to the western part of the property and so forth. It's it's like getting to know a new town when you live there, you know, the 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 roads and so forth. <clears throat> but it did take me quite a while. And now, um, and I have to say my my co-workers would agree, when we make reference to something, we'll say, oh, you know where that Japanese maple, it's the one at the Porter, um, it's next to the Porter Mausoleum, just behind the, um, just b- behind the, uh, the gents uh, monument, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how we make a uh, reference uh, mostly. And we do have often, we have people that say, oh my gosh, I've been driving around for 10 minutes. I can't get out of here. <laughs> and so Exactly. So we we either um, are really good with our directions, or we just say, "Let me hop in my vehicle, follow me, and I'll I'll take you to the to the exit." And so, yeah, yeah, there is definitely that, and that that brings to the point too is that Laurel Hill East is seventy eight acres. You saw how big it was. You couldn't possibly walk mm-hmm. it that afternoon. And then um, and then uh, Laurel Hill West in Valley Kenwood is one hundred and eighty seven acres. Oh, so between the two, 265 acres of beautifully landscaped property. Mm. Yeah, there are some, I'm um, thinking in town of Washington, D.C. here, we have Arlington National Cemetery is 639 acres. <laughs> and there's a lot of straight lines, but there's a lot of hills. And I just always have to keep my bearings as to where the river is. Like the river is just yes. north of you. <laughs> so right, yep. right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank goodness for the rivers. Those are also points of reference. Exactly. And, and also south, north. Yeah. Uh, and Arlington. Mm-hmm. Wow. I, I went there uh, when the American Public Gardens Association event was there, Kathy, and I was it was humbling and and very very uh emotional as well and also uh inc- incredibly impressive mm-hmm. yeah their tree collection is incredible and you just how well the you know run the place is it's just you know like the military <laughs> you got to you got to keep it in check because there's so many visitors coming from all over the world at the same time as it's an active burial place um, and so there's cemeteries, uh, you know, coming in and out that there, that there are ceremonies going on all the time. Um, so back to Laurel Hill, I want to give you a little bit of time to talk about the discrete garden areas. So we talked about that shrubbery and also any new additions that you're making to the landscape. Yes. So at both properties, I'll start with Laurel Hill East, the one in the East Falls section of Philadelphia. Um, we have several things going on simultaneously. So in the fall, we plant roughly uh, each fall a, a additional 2,500 daffodil bulbs. Uh, we have a contractor that plants them for us. It's a it's a special mix that Devrumen Bulbs does for us of five cultivated varieties, beautiful colors. Uh, and so Laurel Hill mix gets planted each fall. And then uh, we also uh, at our gatehouse, our main entrance, we have a pollinator garden 
that's outside the um, entrance. And that pollinator garden is uh, 25 different plants of which 23 are native. So uh, it's we have that. You walk in the gatehouse, and I think as you remember, there is a rock garden. Mm-hmm. And it's, I have to, I know I build it, so I'm going to, of course, be excited about it. <laughs> but it is really cool. It is so unique. And it's a beautiful reflection of sense of place. And I'll tell you why. In the rock garden, not only do we have cool bulbs and rock garden plants, plants that stay small or need well-drained full sun conditions. But we, the whole rock garden is comprised of Wissahickon schist. Wissahickon schist, there's a Wissahickon uh, Creek uh, nearby. uh, And the Wissahickon schist is a type of substrate rock that is in that entire area. It's often unearthed and it was used as the foundations in the early days of the cemetery for the large monument. So Wissick and Schist was what was used. So I used pieces that we had at the cemetery in the rock garden. Plus, uh, in our area where we kept, it was our service area, um, where the vehicles and and the uh, equipment is stored, there was a huge pile of broken ornaments. And what I mean by ornaments, these were pieces that over the years had broken off various monuments. They might be a urn at the top, or they might be an angel or something, a canthus leaves or a column top that broke off that couldn't be put back on, but they didn't want to throw it away. So they just, they, they compiled them. And so after a while, um, it was quite a large pile. I found it uh, when I first started there and said, this is going to be a really cool rock garden. Not only will it have Wissahick and Schist, but it will have these architectural objects that were once part of the cemetery monuments. And now they're incorporated in the rock garden in a very artful and thoughtful and beautiful way. So it's a really cool, cool uh, garden. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I was just going to interject that uh, I think rock garden is just such a natural addition to a cemetery garden. Um, as you said, you have the pieces that you can work with, some of the old stones, and you have the topography, yes. you know, great drainage and hill there, and just a natural addition. I think that more cemetery gardens should have them. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a really nice way to offer a unique uh, types of plants, and and there's um, rock gardens allow people to kind of. Um, uh, wander through them and, and check out the plants uh, from above. Often they're dwarf plants or smaller plants, um, but unique things that you don't see in most herbaceous garden beds uh, often. So, yeah. Um, and then, of course, you were we talked about the medallion garden. I just want to mention that is our, it's our shrub collection. But within the medallion garden, we have another pollinator garden uh, in one of the lots that's within this. Plus, we have a dwarf and miniature conifer garden to show the public what kind of dwarf and miniature conifers can be grown in the Philadelphia area. And then we have a new one within the that is all been uh, started since you had seen it back in August. It's actually going to be for uh, dwarf and miniature uh, deciduous shrubs, hmm. which is going to be really cool. So um, all sorts of cool things. Um, and, um, um, and so the other great thing at Laurel Hill East is our entire hillside. I think you had seen it when you were there, correct? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that whole hillside has been full of some native plants, uh, such as Roos, uh, the big staghorn sumac. However, a lot of it is English ivy. It's things like uh, the uh, hops, Japanese hops. Uh, th- there's a lot of different invasive plants that we have there. So uh, we undertook with uh, Larry uh, Wiener Associates to do a plan and to be implemented to redo the entire uh, hillside, which is like a rock face and very steep in some sections. And it will be replaced with native plants in a meadow-esque type of uh, feeling. So these will be rock outcrops uh, that will have uh, meadow type plants uh, planted. And that will be all along Kelly Drive. And as you drive along, you'll be able to look up and instead of seeing uh, weeds 
<laughs> and trash and and other types of invasive plants like Alanthus. Um, it will actually be uh, the will keep the uh, staghorn sumac and um, utilize native plants and increasing pollinator value that much more. Very excited about that project. And last but not least at Laurel Hill East, we have a new green burial section. Hmm. So that bids the question, what is a green burial, right? So a lot of people ask, what is it? And uh, I'm happy to say it's a green burial <clears throat> uh, model that is something where people the, the body is not preserved. There's no formaldehyde used. Um, and so the burial has to happen shortly after the person's passing. So what happens is the, the body is, is kept uh, refrigerated and quickly uh, the a green burial area, uh, a, a hole is dug four feet down and the body is uh, encased in either a shroud or a biodegradable shroud, silk, linen, uh, cotton, or in a biodegradable casket such as pine or wicker. So I, I always think about times in the past where I remember people would talk about graves and I remember my dad saying, oh gosh, I don't want anything special. Just put me in a pine box and throw me in the ground, you know? So <laughs> that's literally what happens. Um, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a, a burial option that a lot of people are, are siding with today because they just like the fact that there's no uh, preservative, fewer chemicals used and less impact on the environment. So mm -hmm. that's, that's called Valley View Green at Laurel Hill East. Interesting. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, those who are very eco-conscious, a lot of us gardeners are looking into those green burial options and how we can do that more naturally without, again, introducing chemicals, more chemicals into the ground at that point. Yes, yes. And, and it's, it's something because um, a lot of people when they, when they ask, they, if they, if they want me to describe it very, very quickly, it's basically being buried in a garden. That's what it's like. There will be uh, uh, native uh, shrubs, trees, uh, grasses, and herbaceous plants in this Valley View Green. And so it'll be a beautiful place uh, to see and a beautiful place in which to be buried. Hmm. And does Laurel Hill East, I believe they have a columbarium. So if you were to um, yes. have your loved one uh, in ashes, uh, they're put in the columbarium rather than spread in a location. Yes, we have both options available. Um, people, that's what's nice about both East and West. We're able to offer uh, not only ash scattering, also uh, cremated remains in an urn can be um, memorialized in a, in a wall. Um, at both sections. And so we do the same at East. And, and so, um, yes, you can have ashes sprinkled, you can have them in an urn and, and preserve that way. And you can go with a, a traditional burial option. And now you have a green burial option. So um, one stop okay. shop. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm hearing more of the about the different traditions people are starting, and I've even heard um, some people discussing having certain city parks set aside for scattering ashes. Um, and of course, that's that can get some controversy from the neighbors, and you know, how many ashes are we talking about? How many cemeteries uh, ceremonies are taking place? But yes. I think that's already happening, yeah. I want to say, yeah. just not, you know, it's kind of under the radar. Yeah. Um, so this is a good thing to know. I, I know a lot of times people will have, they'll, they'll feel funny about ashes being spread. And understandable. They, it, it represents a human body. So yeah, people, people, I can understand that. Um, what the, uh, the science behind a cre cremated remains are that when a, when a uh, uh, person is, is uh, buried, or excuse me, when a person is, is cremated, all that remains after the high um, heat usage is it's, and the body is, is uh, uh, all that remains, the body's burned uh, is, are the bones and the teeth and any, perhaps something like a, you know, if there was a titanium joint or something like that, those remain. And so, um, they remove the any of the titanium or metal parts are removed. However, what remains, the bones and the teeth, are actually ground into a very fine powder, and that's what we call ashes. So there, we think that it's just it, they've just scooped up, you know, the the ash from burning, but it's not quite like that. 
Um, and so, um, and what those ashes are after they're the ground is uh, the fact that uh, the uh, they're they're also um, uh, what what remains is high in sodium and 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 also uh, high in calcium. So when they're sprinkled around on grass, you you could you you will have to remember that or or in a garden that um, the alkaline the the calcium and the sodium can be detrimental to the plantings. Uh, and so that's also a reason why uh, there's some controversy about it. A lot of golf, golf courses won't allow it, uh, things like that. Um, it's it, mm -hmm. the, the toxicity, I guess you could say, is relatively short-lived. It's not forever, but the sodium and the calcium does affect um, uh, what's, what's planted there. So that's something to consider. Good to know. And so... Many historic cemeteries, like Laurel Hill, there are famous people interred there. And so I wanted to know if you had any fun stories about some of the people that we know are at Laurel Hill. Yeah, so so we have, um, and again, when it, we I refer to Laurel Hill, uh, Laurel Hill, uh, there's east, of course, and west. So at, at, uh, at Laurel Hill East, um, the, the I, I should mention some of the more famous uh, people that are um, in horticulture, uh, the Wisters, Gertrude and John Wister, who were very instrumental in Scott Arboretum. Um, and uh, uh, John Wister was also um, a, uh, a president of the American Iris Society. They are buried there. Um, and then you've heard of Morris Arboretum, which is up in Chestnut Hill, Pennsylvania. Uh, John and Lydia, uh, which are brother and sister, uh, they were, they are also buried there and at Laurel Hill East and West, we have survivors of the Titanic buried there as well as people that passed on the Titanic, such as the Gerard family. So, um, and then at West, uh, Teddy Pendergrass, uh, he is, he is, uh, buried there. And so when you start to look at our website, you start to see some of the famous people that are, are buried there, um, you, you see that they're captains of industry. Some people, some are well-known from brands, Briar's Ice Cream, the Briar family is there, um, things like that. There's quite a few well-known people. And honestly, Kathy, people ask me all the time, do you ever see any like, you know, supernatural? And I have to say, I have not. Mm -hmm. All I experience there is a beautiful, peaceful, and tranquil place. It's, it really is. I've never felt anything like that. I, I just haven't. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I like to think the spirits are happy because we're taking care of the grounds and making it look beautiful. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would, I would agree on that. And then I think that the spirits, if they're going to haunt any place, it's usually the place that they resided in. Yes. Um, not the place that they have laid to that, rest. That makes sense. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that does bring us to uh, the new trend, which is an old trend because nothing is new, right? <laughs> exactly. everything, is just, everything just has a new name to it. And the new name is uh, Cemetery Tourism yes. or Cemetery Tourist. So do you see an uptick in visitors these days? Yes, we do. So for, for two, there's, there's reasons, reasons why, uh, large reasons why. But first of all, COVID. So people found that they needed a place to go. Uh, they were inside. They wanted to be outside and safe. And the, and the parks were filling up. They really were. So the cemetery was found by many of most of the public to be wonderful places to really be able to spread out, safely social distance, be outside, fresh air, walk the dog, jog, do the things that they want to do that gave them a feeling of some normalcy during such a stressful and crazy time. So that's one of the things uh, that was was uh, uh, hugely helpful uh, with that. I mean, that that was really something. But we have people, um, we have great programming there. The programming is so cool. So Kathy, can you imagine watching, uh, let's, let's, let's say uh, Young Frankenstein. What mm -hmm. a great movie that is. <laughs> we actually show movies on this large inflatable screen and people can bring snacks and their lawn chairs and sit and watch a movie in the cemetery. So we have that. And then we have a wonderful programs manager who works really hard to provide fascinating programs, docent led tours, 
Um, we have a 501k um, uh, run. We have a grave diggers ball, which is a fundraiser. It's all a lot of a, a great deal of enjoyment. But um, truly, people come from all over to see the cemetery, learn about the history, about the famous people buried there. And did you know, Kathy, there's somebody that is really famous and their their monument is there, but they're not buried there. Hmm. You know who that might be? I have no idea. This is at Laurel Hill East. And her name is Adrian Balboa. Oh. Yeah. Isn't that cool? So (laughs) uh, part of the scene in in one of the Rocky movies was Adrian passes away, and it shows Sylvester Stallone or Rocky um, kneeling at a a graveside. And uh, that was at Laurel Hill East. And so what was done was a a movie prop. Uh, It was a real piece of granite, you know, has says Adrian Balboa and years of uh, birth and death. And uh, it's actually right near the entrance. We landscape it and people come from all over the country. They go on a special Rocky tour. That's one of their stops. And so, um, so the tourism, tourism is big. And as the gardens have also grown, if you will, and, and increased, we have more and more people staying longer to experience not only the history, but also the horticulture on which we were founded. So it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, locally, uh, Arlington offers a tree tour and a garden tour in the spring and the fall. So I'm I'm glad to see those being offered more and more of horticultural tie-ins for cemeteries, aside from the programming that you're talking about, which is great to draw people in. And you mentioned people bringing in their dogs. I know different places have different rules, but you allow leashed dogs, I assume? Yes, um, we allow dogs. Um, and yes, they should be on a leash just to protect others. Um, but yeah, and and so many of them are, it's it's such a delight, Kathy, because I get to know these people. I, I don't ever learn their names, but I know their, their dogs' names, which is great. Uh, so much fun. And we'll refer to the people that walk. Oh, yeah. Remember the lady with that really cute Shih Tzu that's black, you know, things like that. So yeah, there's, there's that. And we also have a pet cemetery. So a mm. pet cemetery, it's it's one of the prettiest ones you're ever going to want to see. I know people think pet cemetery and they think of the horror movie, but this is a beautiful garden setting in which uh, pets are also interred. Uh, pets are put through an aquamation process, which basically dissolves the pet's body and um, leaves the bones and the bones are powdered, put in a, a container, and then they are buried. So it's a it's another option. Uh, it, it is not it's unlawful to bury pets with humans. So it's just not done. So so we have a separate pet cemetery, and it is uh, uh, yeah really really a beautiful setting. Uh, something well worth checking out. Hmm. I did not know about that law, but uh, <laughs> hmm. well, yes. and I was going to mention that in D.C. Congressional Cemetery is you know very urban location and that has a very active dog walking club and you actually have to join it um, to be able to bring your dog in because of the amount of pressure of how many people want to be walking their dogs in there so definitely look up the rules uh, for the cemetery that you want to visit before you bring your canines with you but it seems that most welcome them um, but just whether you have a permit or not for that yes precisely yep yeah Hmm. And so it brings us also to the other thing that tourists like to see in the garden beside in the cemetery Mm -hmm. is the artwork and the sculptures. It's I know it's attractive to photographers of all kinds and also to art lovers. So are there some particular pieces at either Laurel Hill East or the other location that people gravitate to? Yes. Uh, Laurel Hill East has a sculpture that uh, is of a mother with two uh uh, babies, basically two young children. This was a woman that supposedly drowned, uh, and uh, her children, I believe, also. Uh, but that is a very popular sculpture and monument. Uh, we have a lot of different types of um, monuments that also have horticultural symbolism in them, such as the passion flower, rose, lilies. There's that. Um, some of the sculptures of the people uh, that were uh, had passed also are there. And you're going to see the mausolea, and it shows you different architectural styles through the years, especially mid-19th century up to the early 20th century. So you will see um, the Gothic style. You will see uh, styles such as uh, the iconic uh, um, 
columns, a, 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 a Greco-Roman, a Roman Greco, however you would wish to say it, style, and Art Nouveau, which is early 20th century. So incredible. Plus, you peer through the doors, which are glass, often in metal, and you can see the stained glass windows in the back, and they are true works of art. Hmm. Yeah, and here in D.C. we have Rock Creek Cemetery, which dates back to 1719, and there's Mausoleum Row on that. It was definitely a period, uh, I'm going to call it the robber baron period, <laughs> where, <Yeah. laughs> where those were being built and the money that went into those. Um, and incredible. Pr- pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, you wouldn't see those typically today. I would would think a you're not going to give the space over to that but b the resources needed to build something like that yes and today um especially the granite the marble there aren't the crafts people anymore that uh can do a lot of that kind of work that did it in the past um a lot of it today is is uh machine done uh and so forth uh so the craftsmen uh and the people that did that kind of work um it could still be done it just would be uh obviously very expensive, but um, the work that and the attention to detail in these mausolea are incredible. And you'll never see this kind of, um, never see this kind of uh, art uh, again. It's just just uh, very unique to that period, especially on uh, periods of, uh, or on monuments and, and graves, uh, gravestones. Mm-hmm. And so finishing out our conversation, I wanted to ask if there are other garden cemeteries and other cities that you recommend visiting? Ah, okay. Gosh. So Spring Grove in Cincinnati, mm-hmm. Ohio, highly recommend that. Um, mm-hmm. And you were mentioning about the, the, the one in DC, of course, uh, there's also, um, and I, of course, I'm forgetting the name at the moment of the one in Atlanta, but Atlanta also. I think it's Oak Hill. Oak Hill. Okay. I correct. think it is Oak Hill. That's where Margaret Mitchell is buried. That's right. Or yes. Oakland. I have to look it up. I will look it up for you. Um, but that one in Atlanta is gorgeous and not to be missed for those, as you described, the, the cradle graves that are, they call them down their garden beds or garden graves. Uh-huh. Yes. They're, they're still maintained by volunteers today and just beautiful. Indeed. And then last but not least is one is the very first rural cemetery. Once again, I'll mention Mount Auburn in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. A exceptionally beautifully well-kept uh, cemetery. And we aspire to be um, the quality that they are. Uh, they, they just, they do it so well. They really do. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm looking it up and I misspoke. It's historic Oakland, Oakland. Oakland. Yes. Oakland. And I've been there okay. twice and I would, next time I go to Atlanta, I will be back because it's something to see in every season as well. Um, but really close to downtown, maybe a five minute, you know, taxi ride over. So Okay. Pretty yeah. pretty easy yeah. and accessible. And since you mentioned um, some of the DC ones, I'll just say uh, really quickly, Rock Creek Cemetery has more trees than the U.S. National Arboretum is one of their boasts. Oh. And wow. it's right tucked into Northeast DC, not far from the Brooklyn neighborhood and the uh, soldier's home. And it's home to some incredibly famous works of art, including August St. Godin's Grief that people are just in love with that so i highly recommend Mm, visiting that one the other one uh, that i would recommend in dc to visit is oak hill cemetery in georgetown uh, which was uh, founded in 1849 by ww corcoran to serve as a place of beauty and inspiration for the living was his quote and it's a gothic style cemetery it is on a very steep hillside look overlooking rock creek park Uh, so bring your walking shoes Oh, yes. And yes. <laughs> I, I can't forget, Kathy. Mm-hmm. The other thing I must mention, how could I forget, besides Mount Auburn and Spring Grove in oh, Cincinnati, yeah. there is Greenwood in Brooklyn, New York. Oh, yes. Amazing. Yep. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, uh, definitely. Something to see. You don't have to be into graves at all. Just go there for the, the, the views. and, and the- Just for the views of the city and looking back and exactly over the waterway and yeah so same thing at at oak hill you're overlooking rock creek park and you're seeing uh famous names buried there that you would know from history including confederate spies and the washington post publisher Catherine graham so you know you will recognize a lot of names on a lot of tombstones indeed Hmm. indeed yep 
So how can listeners contact you to get in contact for visiting Laurel Hill? Is it open? They can just walk in any time of uh, the year? Yes. Great question. So we are open um, every day of the year. Uh, Our gates are typically 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Once uh, daylight savings time uh, changes, uh, which is going to be relatively soon, we will be uh, 7 a.m. Uh, till 5 p.m. Uh, just with with uh, uh, once the cemetery is uh, naturally uh, sun goes down. So, um, but it's 365 days a year. It's free. You can come in. Uh, there's plenty of uh, both locations. Uh, you can park along uh, the roadsides and so forth. Come in and enjoy the setting, and then check out our website. That's the best place to get all the information about both the east and west locations. And it is Laurel Hill, P as in Paul, H as in Harry, L as in Lamb, dot com, laurelhillphil.com. Great. And I'll include that link in our show notes for our listeners to access that too. Excellent. Yeah, great. And um, through that, should they wish to contact me specifically about questions about the horticulture, about the tree collection, and uh, also uh, other types of horticulture related items, uh, they can certainly do so through the website. Great. Thank you, Greg. My pleasure. Celosia plant profile. Celosia, Celosia argentea, is an annual flowering plant in the amaranth family that is also known as wool flower, or feather coxcomb. Depending on the variety, the flowers can be bright yellow, orange, deep red, purple, or pink. They have a long season of bloom from June until heavy frost. They originate from East Africa and are hardy to USDA zones 10 and 11. So, in most areas, they are started by direct sowing seeds or transplanting seedlings after the threat of frost is gone in spring. Celosia will self-sow and return year after year in the same spot, if you let them. There are three major forms of Celosia blooms. The spicata are very narrow and candle-like. The plumosa are flame-like. And the cristata are broader and can form into interesting shapes like coral or fans. Celosias make sturdy and long-lasting cup flowers and can be dried easily, though they lose their bright coloring and fade after time. The foliage of celosia can be bright green or dark red. The leaves are edible and should be gathered when young and tender before the flowers emerge. They are traditionally boiled or steamed as a side dish that tastes similar to spinach. Celosia grows best in full sun and well-draining soils. It can be grown in containers or in beds. They may require staking if they grow too tall or top heavy. Celosia, you can grow that. What's new this week? Well, over at the community garden, the dahlias are looking spectacular. I think they've really appreciated this mild October weather we've been having. And I started another row uh, that is parsley. And we wrote about parsley in the October 2022 issue of Washington Gardener. And it made me think, hmm, I let it kind of peter out a few years ago and I really should restart some. I'm taking a chance, you know, it's a little late in the year to be starting parsley seeds, but, you know, uh, better to try now than not at all. In the local gardening world, there are some events I want to let you know about. November 2nd, Wednesday at 10 a.m. at Brookside Gardens and repeated on Thursday, November 3rd, in case that date doesn't work for you, is the Chrysanthemum Tour. And that is showing you some of their beautiful selections inside the conservatory. Also on Wednesday the 2nd, a Gardener's Focus Tour of Specialty Mums is taking place at 2.30 p.m. at Hillwood Museum and Gardens in Washington, D.C. That is also offered again on Friday, November 4th 
and you can register for that through the hillwoodmuseum.org. For the Brookside event that I mentioned, you can register for that through montgomeryparks.org. And then Thursday, uh, every Thursday throughout the fall, really, there are noontime webinars that are free. You just have to register online to get the Zoom link, and those are hosted from Smithsonian Gardens and you would go online to gardens.si.edu and then you'll see under the learn tab and let's talk gardens. Um, Upcoming one on November 3rd is on revolutionize your tree pruning, learn to prune better and speak for the trees. And then finally, fall leaf viewing on Saturday, November 5th is offered from 6 to 9 p.m. at the U.S. National Arboretum. This is the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., uh, taking place in the National Bonsai and Penyang Museum. And they are doing some fall leaf viewing in appreciation of the changing seasons and Japanese culture. The event features an introduction to Japanese haiku poetry, tea ceremony, sake tastings for those 21 and over, and a traditional koto music. Tickets cost $30, and you can register for that through the Friends of the National Arboretum FONA website. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spate, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. The last word. You are invited to submit the last word on the Garden DC podcast. This is a new segment we've added, and I'm looking for diverse voices to contribute to it. We're looking for observations and opinions on anything garden related. You can talk about how much you love squirrels or hate weeds or vice versa. Maybe you feel strongly about a new plant introduction or a garden practice. Really, anything goes. Perhaps you've already written a blog post, article, or essay that you'd like to share. Start it off by saying, this is the last word on your topic of choice by your name. Feel free to mention your job title and place of work if it's garden related, and you can mention your social media links. Example, this is the last word on squirrels by Joe Smith of the ABC Gardening blog. Tip, it helps to type out what you plan to say, then read it out loud a few times before you hit record. Please keep it between two and five minutes long. To record it, save it as an MP3 file. This is easy to do on your smartphone's voice memo app and any other digital recording program or device. To submit it, send the file to me, Kathy Gents, to my phone at 240-603-1461 or by email to kathygents at gmail.com put last word in the subject or message line. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden dc slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you.
You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.